Thank you. I hope I don't land on it. Um, well, thank you. It's uh, really wonderful to be here at this uh, austere place and august place and with all these wonderful people and being able to uh, um, address this important problem. And uh, following up to our previous session, I'm sure we'll be raising more questions than answers, but that's at least a start. So uh, my topic today is creating and assessing evidence for persons with multiple chronic conditions. And I sort of think of this as something that's important for us as clinicians and how to apply the evidence that exists, what questions we want to know about the research. For those of us as researchers who are designing studies to address clinical issues of people with multiple morbidity. And finally, for those of us who are synthesizing the evidence that already exists, is it applicable? So I decided to come up with one overarching question that we should be thinking about in terms of clinical interventions for older adults with multiple chronic conditions. And the overarching question is, does this intervention, whether it be preventive, diagnostic, therapeutic, rehabilitative, surgical, palliative, or whatever, does it provide benefit greater than harm for older adults with multiple chronic conditions? A very simple question until you start looking at all, the, all of that, that it entails. So question number one is, does this study, whether it's one you're creating or one that you're evaluating, does it apply to your patients or what population? Does it match the target population. And I don't have to tell this audience that the vast majority of clinical trials do not. But what we do want to know, and there was some discussion uh, today of what population we're talking about, this is a uh, slide that we created for our work in uh, what we're now calling patient priority aligned care. And we started with the premise that does do current disease approach to care design guidelines, evidence-based guidelines apply? And we would say there's probably about, if you take people over the age of 70, shall we say, probably about 30% of those would fit into this category of yes, current disease guidelines probably do apply because they have a, a long life expectancy, so they're going to live long enough to benefit. They have few conditions, so there's going to be less of the interaction between those conditions and the treatment. And they remain fit and functional. For this group, you probably are appropriate to continue disease-based guideline care as long as it's consistent with their preferences. On the other hand, we have about 15% of older adults um, who have a very decreased life expectancy, so they're not likely to benefit from disease-based decision-making. They have advanced, usually a single advanced illness that's driving their care, um, and this is the time to de-escalate or de-prescribe approach palliative care and symptom management. So it's really what we would say about 40 to 50% of the older population that I think is particularly important as we're talking about multimorbidity today. These are the people that are getting shorter and shorter life expectancy, an increased number and severity of conditions, and importantly, it's starting to affect their, their uh, function. I think this is the population we're particularly talking about and interested in today. So the first question, do we have the right population? I think this is key for those of us who are doing research in the challenges, is there is no such thing as an average result. As you know, clinical trials report average results. But the very heterogeneity, whether you're talking about health conditions, combinations of health conditions and severity, socioeconomic, ethnic, racial, um, there, there is no such thing as an average older adult with multimorbidity. So I think all of the research and the answers are in the subgroups. And um, as we well know, statisticians hate subgroups. But if you're a clinician trying to, to uh, treat older adults, you love subgroups. Um, and so we need to make sure that there's as many of those represented as possible. And that's a very difficult thing to do to get the right number to do that, which is, I think, one of the major reasons why much of the research does not apply. The second question is, are the appropriate outcomes to study in multiple chronic conditions? And I think that those of us who are doing system, systematic reviews really need to be concerned about what outcomes are driving the study. And I will start with um, and make a, a very specific statement, which you may disagree with, 
disease-specific outcomes and events have no role in outcome measurement for people with multiple conditions and functional impairment. I will say that quite de um, definitively, because I'm sure somebody is going to have a, a disagreement. I would also say very often mortality, which is the driving force for most clinical trials, particularly in the cardiovascular literature, very often doesn't apply because it's not necessarily the outcome that matters most to older adults with multiple chronic conditions. So again, is the, out, these, the problem with disease-specific outcomes is they don't answer the question, is the benefit greater than harm? And I'll show you why. Um, it doesn't address the fact that older adults vary in the outcome that matters most to them, and that has been shown over and over again. So there's not a one-size-fits-all outcome. Third of all, how do you compare disease outcomes? And I'll give you an example. So I will start by saying that disease-specific outcomes are irrelevant in clinical decision-making for persons with multiple chronic conditions, and I hope I get some pushback on that. So I'll give you an example. There's always trade-off between conditions. Uh, in my previous research, I looked at falls and fall injuries, and one of the works that we did because we treat people with multiple chronic conditions about a third of older population have the combination of at risk for serious fall injuries and hypertension, a direct, uh, a direct comparison. So many, many, many studies coming out, and in the US, Sprint came out that changed everything. We're now supposed to get, as long as you can stand up without passing out, your blood pressure is too high. Um, it's probably a little overstatement, but not by a lot. Um, serious fall injuries. So, so how do you compare, if you're going to look to see what's right or wrong, again, in, in the people in the clinical trials, they didn't have an increased risk of fall injuries, but even in that older population, it was still a relatively older population. How do you compare? How do you ask somebody, would you rather have a stroke or a myocardial infarction, or would you rather fall and have a hip fracture or a head injury? And you know what? We were stupid enough to ask that question. <laughs> So we, we asked people uh, in New Haven, Connecticut, people who had both hypertension and were at fall risk, is, um, you know, what is the trade-off? Um, and about half of them prioritized, I'd rather avoid a stroke or a heart attack, even if it means I'm going to have adverse effects of my medications and I'm at risk for falls. And about half prioritized, the most important thing to me is not to have a hip fracture because my mother had one or my sister had one, and it's the worst thing in the world I can think about. So again, this is one simple, very common scenario. Multiply that by infinity, and those are all the uh, disease-based questions that it, it's impossible to, to compare. And I think that's why some of the disease-based outcomes is very, uh, very irrelevant. So if that isn't appropriate, what are appropriate outcomes for older adults with multiple chronic conditions? Obviously, they need to be meaningful to older adults with multiple chronic conditions. As such, it needs to address the fact that they vary in the priorities, the outcomes that matter most to them, and the care that they're willing and able to put up with to get those outcomes. Um, it has to uh, address the fact that people are at risk for multiple, very often conflicting disease-specific outcomes. And most importantly, it needs to address for each individual person for this intervention because every intervention has benefits as well as harms. As far as we can tell, vitamin B12 is the only intervention that I have ever seen that does not have an adverse effect. And if somebody in this audience knows of one, then, then I, then, then I uh, can't even use that anymore. So appropriate outcomes, I would say we want to think about it both at the population level and at the personal level. And there was a lot of discuss previously that People vary, and we really need to think about at the person level, which is not something that happens in research very much, but I think it's the only answer to the heterogeneity of this population. So again, at the population level, it needs to be meaningful to, uh, to uh, patients. It needs to, uh, I put in quotes, all diseases, essentially all diseases need to exert their effect, because if we're going to compare across diseases and interventions, needs to be, we need to have outcomes that matter no matter what your combinations of conditions are. It needs to, uh, people need to be able to prioritize among these different outcomes. Um, and I would say that um, we want to be able to measure benefit and harm on the same scale. Uh, so we want to be able to make decisions that really do measure net benefit versus harm. 
And one of the ways we've come up with this is what we call universal health outcomes, by which we mean they're cross-disease specific and they're outcomes that matter to everyone. Um, and these are three categories. Obviously, there's others, um, but older adults want to either want to be as functional, well, they want to be all of these. They want to be as functional as possible. And uh, Luigi and I were talking at the break that one of the things we need to come up with is better measures of function because I think it is the most important outcome. And we still have very crude measures after these many years of function. People want to be as free of symptoms as possible, pain, fatigue, et cetera. And obviously, if possible, they would like to live as long as possible and survive. There are other universal outcomes, but I think this captures a lot of what disease affects and a lot of what people care about. So to look at, we wanted, if this was going to be uh, an appropriate way to start looking at outcomes in this population, then we need to see that most diseases do exert effect on these outcomes that matters to individuals. So what we did in a, a representative sample of the US population, people over 65, we looked at five common chronic conditions, heart failure, COPD, dementia, arthritis, and depression. And what we did was just to look at the what statistical association of these three outcomes with these conditions. And very simply on this slide, daily function, um, affects all, uh, these diseases affect, all affect daily function, all five diseases. If you look at symptoms, all of, of the diseases except dementia um, worsen people's symptoms, not surprisingly. And uh, if you look at mortality or death, all the diseases except for arthritis. So again, not surprisingly, these are what the findings you would expect, suggesting that we really do have universal outcomes that can be used to measure the effect of all interventions on this population because these are the outcomes that people care about and we can measure them. So, but the question is, because it's a trade-off, right? Everybody wants to live as long as possible, to be as free of symptoms as possible, and to be as functional as possible. But we know that some interventions are going to affect some of those and others, and some might actually, some, some things that improve function may shorten lifespan. On the other hand, we certainly know for, for treatment of a lot of particularly um, oncologic diseases that we, we um, increase symptoms and increase functional decline, at least for the period of treatment. Um, so there is a trade-off amongst those, and so we need to see can people prioritize if there is a trade-off. And in work that t Terry Freed, I would say, Terry Freed is the other Freed in geriatrics, um, looking to see, asked um, a, a group of about three or 400 older adults with a range of common uh, chronic conditions, could, if they had to pick among those three, maintaining function, relief of pain and other symptoms, and staying alive as long as possible, regardless of the function and pain, what was most important to you? And people could very readily differentiate, about 42% said maintaining function, no matter what their symptoms or uh, length of life was going to be, was most important. About a third prioritizing symptoms, and about a little bit less than a third prioritizing keeping alive. And again, remember, this is what most clinical trials uh, look at, uh, staying alive. Um, so it makes us sort of think about universal outcomes, maybe a, a little bit way forward mm -hmm. until we come up with something better. But again, I think we do know um, that, that in, in support of doing this, that patients do think in terms of these universal health outcomes. They don't unless we ask them about it. They don't necessarily, I mean, if you ask your patient what, why you want your diabetes uh, treated, they say, well, because I have to have a better hemoglobin A1C. Um, um, yeah. And uh, obviously that's not the case. When you really ask them why they, they um, want to keep their hemoglobin A1C is be because they think it's going to keep them from having a heart attack or having an amputation. So is that the case or not? We, always, we de really don't know in this population. And importantly, there's a relatively small number of meaningful outcomes that probably across the world, uh, again, in the, uh, the World Health Organization has done some wonderful work at looking at, at outcomes across the country. They may measure it a little bit differently across countries, but pretty much the same categories. 
Again, I, people are able to articulate the priorities in the face of trade-offs with these universal health outcomes. And so I think they, and we can measure benefit and harm on the same scale, which I think is very important. And I think they are appropriate, therefore, for research as well as for decision making. So that's at the, at the population level. But I want to get back to the person level because, again, this population varies so much is should we be thinking more about person level, patient, people identifying their own outcomes um, to, to measure both in clinical practice, is the intervention we are offering or the combination of interventions, is it giving people what they want um, or not? And also at the research level. And again, there's certainly complexities involved in everybody coming up with their own uh, particular outcome. But there is emerging work, in, certainly in the US, and I suspect hopefully you have examples of what, as well, of identifying patient level outcomes that can be used in clinical trials. An example of them, one is a, a value-based approach to um, health and life goals, SMART goals as we call them, specific, measurable, actionable, reliable, and, and uh, time-bound goals. And I'll show you a little bit about that because that's the approach we're using. A second um, approach is goal attainment uh, scaling, and we've heard um, Dr. Rockwood's name mentioned uh, quite a bit in frailty. He was also one of the originators of the concept of goal attainment scaling, were in, used originally in rehabilitation, but more recently in geriatrics as well, where people do identify the outcomes they're looking for with their, with their treatments, and then they identify what is achieving that goal, what's uh, aspirational, what would really be terrific, but a little bit harder, and what is a failure in achieving their goals. So again, it's, um, and more re work is showing that perhaps it really is doable at a larger scale, um, but still needs work to simplify it enough for clinical practice. Another approach that is being tried now in the United States, particularly for people um, who are more on the frail spectrum, is what we call the personalized PROMs, the personalized uh, patient reported outcome measures. And basically what it is is, is giving people a, a list of it could be 15, 20, 30 outcomes, and amongst those, they pick the outcome that matters most to them. So again, it's constrained by the numbers, but they are able to pick amongst that. And again, then the personalized uh, reported outcome is used to measure success or failure. So there are the beginnings of approaches for personal level outcomes. In the work that we are doing, and I'm uh, uh, Anand Nayak at uh, Baylor University in Houston, Texas, has been the person who's been working with us on this. Um, the idea here is that values are pretty inherent. They don't really change very much in life. Those values that we have early in life are, are keep us through life. So even though the goals may change as our life circumstances change, as our socioeconomic status changes, or our health changes, but the values that underline those goals don't. And they are, um, and I think if I, these would probably all resonate with you as well, uh, connections, relationships, community, spirituality, uh, enjoying life, it could be productivity, learning, recreation, managing our health, and function. So those are the values that keep us going and, and an approach that we use in our work right now for it's called patient priorities care. Um, we work through people's values. It's about a 20 to 30 minute process through people's values to these SMART goals. And the idea here is if you were realizing your value of connectedness, what would you be doing more of? If you were realizing the importance of function to you, what would you be doing more of? And so that's how we get on to these, um, start with the values, link the goals to what matters to them, an action that is the objective manifestation of their value. Again, that can change. How they live out their values can change. It has to be specific enough um, that uh, we can use it to um, uh, measure whether success or failure. Obviously, it has to be actionable. Um, as a clinician, I need to know what to offer you to help you get your goal, given the 27 diseases that you have, um, and uh, it needs to be realistic. And, and this was when we first started doing this, this is what everybody was worried about. People would come up with unrealistic goals. We've now done this in about 500 people, and, and people are incredibly realistic um, on the goals that they, that they think are most important to them.
Um, you can't see this, but this is basically, we're now using this in a, in a clinical practice for a study, this what we call the patient's health priorities template. And uh, you can't see it, but we're re working with primary care providers, and we ask them, what is the least amount of information that you will use to, to try to make decisions in these people with multiple chronic conditions? And so basically, they wanted to know about their life context, their current function and support, what mattered most to them, um, what are some of the key trade-offs that the patients themselves thought that they were facing? Again, three SMART goals, um, three points of their current care that they think they're able to do uh, and meet their goals, and three points of care that they're currently asked to do that they think is just too difficult or not helpful. And then we come up with what, what's called a specific ask, taking everything into account. What do you really want to focus on your health now and if we could focus on it, what is it going to help you do more of? So trying to link the outcomes they want with, with, um, with the care that they're willing and able to do. So what are some of the examples? Again, my guess if I asked you, you would all come up with exactly what's on this slide. These are some actual ones that people told us. I want to be able to babysit my grandchildren every day to help my daughter while she works. This is a woman with end-stage renal disease who was facing dialysis, and she didn't want to do dialysis because she thought it was going to interfere with her ability to, to um, take care of her grandchildren. I want to go shopping with my niece weekly, and fatigue and weakness make this hard. I want to do ceramics again and walk a half a mile with my husband every day, and tiredness makes this difficult. So you can see people are able to identify what for them was what they wanted from their health care. This is what they want their health care to be, what, get, get them more of. Um, and uh, it's, when we first started doing this, we, we started asking people these questions, and they'd never been asked the questions before, and they thought we were crazy. Um, and we were, because we wouldn't be doing this if we weren't. Um, but over time, we really learn from the people how to, how to ask these questions in a way that really gets people to think about. And then we uh, transmit this information to their clinicians, and then we work with them as well in how to translate what disease-based care, which is what they're used to, to, to uh, addressing these types of questions. So our third question is, again, what are the appropriate interventions for people with multiple chronic conditions? And I would say is that um, regardless of what disease you're treating, and right now we still mostly treat diseases. I think once we understand the basic mechanisms that Luigi is going to tell us about, what do you think about next year, two years? <laughs> our basic mechanisms, eventually we won't be talking about treating diabetes or heart failure or arthritis. We, I think we really will get at some basic me uh, mechanisms. They may not all be basic. They may be, some of them may be at the person level. But first of all, is it really the intervention feasible? Because we're not talking about adding yet another hypoglycemic agent or a hypertensive agent to somebody who is otherwise naive to treatment. We're, we're asking that this is the, you know, in my world, maybe the 21st medication we're asking them to do. If we're asking them to check their blood sugars three times a day, this is not the only self-task we're asking them to do. We're asking them to check their feet, to check their eyes, to um, go follow three different uh, diets for their, for their different conditions. So everything we're adding on to is another intervention. So is it really feasible? And this really gets at the question of the burden of the intervention. Is it acceptable? And I think I've heard people already at this conference talk about uh, minimally disruptive medicine um, that um, Victor Montori and other people have done, and Cynthia Boyd, who I think is awakened, is now with us, um, and has, has really done some of the really groundbreaking work. So it's not just, does the intervention effective, but is it really doable, and is the burden adding on to everything else acceptable? And most importantly, are the trade-offs inherent in the intervention explicitly identified. This is important for everybody, but particularly important for these people with multiple conditions who take, who have multiple different treatments um, and different diseases and different priorities. So I think uh, when we think about comparative effectiveness, and I think all research in this population needs to be comparative effectiveness, and needs to be compared to something that's really meaningful interventions in this in this group. There is no place for placebo controls in this population, not when people are already getting, you know, 20 medications and eight or nine different uh, uh, self-management tasks that they need to do. 
So the real question is, does this intervention of interest provide more meaningful uh, benefit than other options in terms of the outcomes that matter, again, the benefit, in terms of the harm, and in terms of, of the uh, burden? And I, some of the questions that I think about when I either think about testing an intervention, thinking about applying it to my patient, or thinking about reviewing the evidence, some of the questions I sort of think about is, again, adding on to multiple existing treatments. And none of the studies ever really talk about that. When is the last time you saw a study that really talked about, well, this adds this amount of burden to people who are already taking other medications? Again, I mentioned at the beginning, and I don't have to tell this audience, the greater heterogeneity of effect in this population is there's a, this is the most heterogeneous population that you will ever study, and the treatment effects are really heterogeneous, and the, uh, the um, odds ratios and the re relative risk reductions reported in the literature have no relevance to this population because of it. I think the other thing that we, that we forget about is the often modest benefits. We always say, not only is it uncertain, even at the certainty level, the amount of benefit is often incredibly modest. And if you look, are people familiar with the SPRINT study? Uh, but I'm sure you have examples here. So the SPRINT study that, that just finished in the United States about a year or so ago, um, where if you'd lowered the blood pressure from 140 on average, um, systolic to 120, they, there was big press all over the papers um, talking about saving lives, saving lives. If we really looked at it, it decreased mortality from about, it overall outcomes from about 3.5 to about 3%. I mean, just um, really a very modest um, decrease, um, at least at a population level. Um, and so, and I think we really lose sight of the fact of that when you think about the burden of care is we're really not, a lot of those interventions are not giving a lot of benefit. And again, as I mentioned, how do you compare harm versus benefit? Who would rather have a stroke versus a hip fracture? How can you even ask that stupid question that I did? Um, and again, how do you assess and compare burden, which I think needs to be part of everything. Um, so again, I'm going to uh, leave with uh, 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 just a uh, few um, suggestions, solutions for how we can move forward in, in studying interventions in people with multiple chronic diseases. Again, we need to, um, and Cynthia Boyd has, I think, been a, a leading uh, proponent of this um, in her work on uh, guidelines, principles of decision-making for chronic condition, multiple chronic conditions. We need to be measuring time to an absolute, absolute benefit in this population. It needs to be very transparently reported in uh, the literature. Um, we need to, again, measure benefit and harm on the same scale. So we, we, um, uh, we can really do a direct comparison of that net benefit versus harm. Uh, we need to ha assess and compare burden. Burden is just as important as benefit in this population, I would, I would tell you. Um, we need to look at the effects in predetermined subgroups of individuals. We can't study everything, but I think maybe using some of the clustering and, and factor analysis that we heard about earlier today, we can come up with some predetermined subgroups that are more homogeneous. Um, and I, I would say to you that when we, and we're going to be working tomorrow, some of us are going to be working tomorrow on systematic reviews. There's a lot of, of talk and effort putting into the relevance of the studies in terms of methodologic uh, quality. I would say at least as important, but often ignored, is the relevance of the clinical significance of, of the study. And I would pose us tomorrow, our, 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 uh, uh, that's going to be a challenge us for us to do is, is assess the clinical relevance as well as the methodologic quality. So again, I'll leave you with um, our overarching question is we want to make sure we have the key subgroups, the outcomes that are meaningful to individuals at the population level. I would suppose that it was something like universal or cross-condition outcomes. At the personal level, it can be smart health goals, goal attainment, or priority patient-reported outcomes. The interventions, we need to address burden as well as time to an absolute amount of benefit. Uh, and I would say, again, that these, uh, we need to use this when we're determining the applicability of existing evidence um, or to driving study design or in clinical decision making. Thank you.